Hello, and welcome to whatever the hell I'm going to call this. Summer gaming list? Summer RPG special? Look, I don't even know what my own formats are here, beyond that I want to talk about a bunch of games in shorter sections instead of doing the massive video essays I've been doing for most of this year. But unlike the winter RPG special six months ago, because back then doing one big video was special for me, here I'm going to just be doing a short video every week because now that's the weird and different thing. Just expect any specials to change whenever my formats change. But hey, maybe there'll be three of these, maybe four. I I'm recording this back in like late April. I have no idea how this is gonna shape up. But this week we have our first game, which is about beautiful robot girls asking serious existential questions in the face of a hopeless and grim world. Huh, wait a second. This is the wrong footage. We're not talking about Nier Automata here, though it is also definitely a good game you should play. But everyone knows that one already. 2B is so popular that you definitely know that one already. Today we're really talking about, well, you saw the title and thumbnail, we're talking about Cry Machina. And well, the first thing you'll notice about Cry Machina is just how cool it looks. I mean, just wow. I mean, I don't usually talk about graphics and visuals, but this is just a triumph of art design, seriously. First, we've got the virtual reality world known as the Imitation Garden. It's just a place to serve as a menu and as a background for conversations between stages, but it's beautiful. This ethereal, heavenly, but still modern aesthetic fits nicely with the fact that this is the only place in the universe that your characters can be at ease right now. And the character designs on display here are similarly excellent, with clothes that feel like something that would actually exist, while also being fashionable and extravagant and quite unique. Basically, everyone looks like a fashion model in the best way. I guarantee you I will never confuse any of the main characters here with characters from any other game. They're just too distinctive. But that's just in VR. In the real world, the girls have to inhabit robotic bodies, and man, things look even better here. These character designs are just stellar. These designs are all obviously robotic with unusual mechanical parts and glowing aspects that really stand out, but there's still enough humanity in their designs for them to be immediately relatable as people. They're perfect. I particularly love the glowing seams on their faces that give the impression of tears in fitting with the title of the game. And the designs of other characters outside of the main group are just as great. World design is a little less impressive though. I mean, it's kind of cool in how strange and unnatural it is, and I mean, it's fitting for a space installation made entirely by and for machines, but it's also all kind of the same and most of it blurs together. It all just ends up feeling kind of like a non-place. Which maybe could have been effective and evocative, but they don't really do anything with it. It's a very video game aesthetic, and these places mostly just exist to be levels between story beats. And that brings us right on to what fills those levels, the gameplay. The gameplay in Cry Machina is simple, but impactful enough. It's carried by its visuals, mostly. You have your basic attacks, a charge attack, the ability to launch enemies and perform finishers if you break their stance, a shooting mode with a charge shot, you can dodge or parry to defend, and you have two sub-weapons that you can configure and that can perform different attack combos on a conditional basis, and which look really cool floating behind you. Honestly, I love remote weapons like these. It's a really cool aesthetic, but in terms of gameplay, yeah, that's kind of it. Normally this is where a gameplay breakdown would go into detail about how this all fits together, but honestly there isn't much to say there. Just attack how you want and defend when the enemy attacks. 
I mean, there's some nuance. Guns are particularly good stance breaks. You can combo charge attacks with finishers on downed enemies for extra damage. But trying to do all this stuff never really felt necessary or rewarding. It kind of feels like I'm role-playing better combat, which helps, but only a bit. At least it all looks pretty. But also, these stages tend to be short, linear runs to the end. They are bite-sized bits of fun, and even the longest will only take, like, 10 minutes if you're slow and exploring everything. Honestly, this structure kind of makes it feel like another game that belongs on a handheld. Probably the PlayStation Vita, since it wouldn't really work elsewhere. I didn't intend for my video on the death of dedicated handhelds to keep being so relevant. This is also an action RPG, not just an action game, but the RPG mechanics don't add much. There are a bunch of numbers to make bigger. There's quite a few numbers, but I don't feel like any of them really matter that much. Even your auxiliary weapons have a full suite of stats. These I understand even less, and I don't know how much they matter, and I don't have that much control over them anyway, with the whole random loot thing. So yeah, I was just completely checked out of the RPG systems pretty much the whole game. Also disappointingly, the post-game and a little bit of the end game are a bit on the grindy side. The game normally does a good job of keeping you close to the ever-increasing level cap, but later on things don't quite keep up. But overall, while the gameplay isn't amazing, it's certainly not why you play the game, it's still serviceable, and it knows not to get in the way and overstay its welcome. Getting to the ending took me under 20 hours, which is impressively brisk by the standards of the genre. The game knows it's mostly carried by its story. There's extra content there if you want it, but it never feels like a distraction or like it's in the way of the core of the experience. And that brings us to the story. A horrific disease known as centrifugal syndrome ravages humanity. Little is known about the disease or how it's contracted, but everyone who contracts it eventually is killed by it. But what truly puts an end to the human race was a series of resource wars that would subsequently break out. At the very end, humanity would launch several projects to attempt to preserve the species. One of these, Project Eden, was a massive undertaking meant to eventually reconstruct humanity from scratch. A project that would be carried out aboard a massive space installation by the actions of 8 Day Ex Machina. Propator I, overseer of the project. Ecclesia II, in charge of maintaining order. Noin the third in charge of Anthropos the fourth in charge of defining humanity, Lethia the fifth in charge of gathering information, Logos the sixth in charge of civilization development and infrastructure, Zoe the seventh in charge of somatic reconstruction, and Enoa the eighth in charge of reconstructing the human psyche. The project was to recreate human minds artificially, beings called EVEs, born from Enor's simulations of human history, who could eventually grow to become a real human recognized by the system, and could exist in the real world through synthetic frames created by the Seven. But something went wrong. Enoa was attacked by an alliance of several other Day Ex Machina, escaping with only two EVs by her side, Mikoto and Ami. They spend years on the run, until our story finally begins. Operating from their small base of operations, a virtual world known as the Imitation Garden, Enoa's group is joined by a newly awakened EV, Leben Distel, a supposed chosen one, though the true meaning of the this is unclear, and it's certainly not your usual Chosen One prophecy story. And with Laban by their side, Enoa's group is finally able to start making progress. And that's where my summary ends and the story begins. It's far from straightforward from there, with several major arcs that are all well paced, and as you can tell, there's plenty of high concept sci fi going on. The idea of what makes someone a person is an obvious one to do with any story involving AI or artificial humans, and one I always love, as is the question of how the value of these lives compared to human lives. But there's also high concept sci fi focusing around ideas like 
memories and even the dark forest theory pops up though mostly as background and maybe a sequel hook but while all this high concept sci-fi stuff may seem dense and inaccessible for some, the heart of the game storytelling is the characters and the family they form. In and amongst all the crazy sci-fi stuff, the story of our four main characters is the real heart of everything. There's Laban, who starts out bitter and misanthropic, but gradually finds happiness for the first time through her new family. Then there's Mikoto, the cool and stylish movie buff. She changes the least, and instead more serves as a reliable anchor for the group. Then there's Ami, a girl in love with the idea of family, and with Mikoto, whose kind personality hides an incredible willingness to do anything for those close to her. And Enoa, the eighth deus ex machina, a soft, caring, yet unemotive girl who serves as a guide to the others despite her sometimes childish behavior. Even if none of them are yet recognized as real humans by the system overseeing the Eden Project, their struggles connect to very simple human needs. To survive, to find meaning, to be loved, and to hold on to these things once they have them. The relatability of these characters does a lot of the legwork in grounding the plot. It is the source of emotional attachment in what is otherwise a very high concept, unreal, and unrelatable story. And of course the other characters have similarly interesting backgrounds and such, they just don't get as much time as the main three. I urge you to collect all three personality data records for each of the Trinity members. They go from a bunch of silly weirdos to being every bit the beautiful and tragic found family our main characters are. At the same time, as you could probably tell from some of the stuff I covered in the intro, there's tons of lore and world building to latch onto too. Even if your characters are at the center of the plot, they still feel small in a way. Like what's happening is a sudden flashpoint where everything wrong comes to a head in a short span of time and you just happen to be the ones who have to deal with it. The last thing that really caught my eye about the story is that, well, it takes a rather dim view of humanity. We're cr Cruel, selfish, hateful, eager to discriminate. We dehumanize anyone who it's too inconvenient for us to respect. We choose conformity over any other virtues. Even love is so often fake, just a performance for the sake of society. It makes you start to wonder if kindness, goodness, and love aren't really human at all, if they're really the defects, and it's all those horrible things that really define humanity. This ain't even just me being nihilistic. The game gets awfully close to most of these ideas just said through the story itself. It never spells them out by having the characters stop and say them explicitly, but this is the impression I got that the game wanted me to think about. And yet it also posits that life can still be beautiful. People can still be beautiful. Even just a few connections can make everything worth it. Looking back to the technical side of the story, it moves at a nice brisk pace. Each chapter has something major happen, and each one only takes about an hour. Along with several conversations between each stage, the game feels very narratively dense. Sort of like Metal Gear Solid games, or at least the ones before MGS4. Rather than being some grand adventure, this is a singular intense incident. There's always some new event or new detail being introduced, and given the stakes it's all quite apocalyptic. Even as several twists change your goals throughout the story, it never really feels padded out as you'll move from one objective to the next. Oh, and small little thing, once you beat the game and get to the new title screen, hit a button to open the title menu and use your left stick or movement controls. The true end is effectively hidden like an easter egg. Don't be like me and think you have to do the post game to see the true ending. I only saw it like two weeks after I saw the regular ending, if not more, and as a result my investment in the characters had kind of waned and I wasn't able to enjoy it as much as I had hoped. But. Weird ways to access the true ending aside, the only real thing holding the plot back, I feel, is the presentation. 
As a mission-based game in a rather abstract world, everything takes place either within the virtual world of the Imitation Garden, or various locations within the facility that are ultimately very interchangeable. At most you're told that a location is important, and very few are actually shown to be important. Which is a shame. It does limit the story to being more about characters and concepts, while the setting stays abstract. It doesn't feel like a world, just like a video game setting. The stages are as important to the story as the stages in an arcade game are. They're just there to be gameplay. But in spite of this one issue, the story remains the game's strong point. Once the novelty of the great character designs wore off, this is what kept me playing. Cry Machina is a beautiful game that exceeded all my expectations. I expected this to be pretty much just the near Automata we have at home, and there probably was some inspiration there, but it manages to nicely stand on its own, particularly in the story and characters, and exploring themes that near Automata never touched. It's just a shame the gameplay is a bit of a letdown. To be honest, the game is more fun to watch and read than it is to play, but the gameplay is serviceable. I don't know, is that damning? I don't think it's any weirder to like this game than it is to like a game with great gameplay but mediocre plot and visual design. And hey, it's much easier to talk about. Visuals I can show you and story I can talk about, but gameplay is extremely difficult to describe, especially when so much of it is about experience and feeling. But ultimately only you can decide how to weigh these elements. For me though, the story was compelling enough to keep me playing, between the enticing sci-fi ideas, compelling characters, and solid pacing that manages to never overstay its welcome. If what you've seen looks interesting, wait for a sale and go for it. But regardless, that's it for this time. I'll see you next week. This is Mikhail, signing off.